Christ. There's not a, anything that you've done. Your position is in the shed precious blood of Jesus Christ that has forgiven you. All he requires of you is when you sin, and you know when you sin, nobody has to, nobody has to tell you. You know when you sin. Your conscience deal with you. All you have to do is go and confess it. Lord, I'm sorry. I really messed up. I just got in the flesh. Forgive me. That's it. They're already, they're not even charged to you. But it's good that you recognize your own unworthiness. Everybody see that? Amen. You know what? This is important that we learn these things because the devil will beat you to death if you don't know him. You know, one of the prophets wrote and said, Two or three different places. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yeah. Amen. And most denominations don't preach anything about this because shoot, they know they'd lose half their congregation if they did. Most people don't understand it because they don't want to. <clears throat> All right. Bessie. Uh, question number five. Where does the cleansing work of the blood operate in a believer? Huh? Hey, Betsy. That's right, hon. That's right. His conscience. A clear conscience is never based on our attainment. We try to, we try to, we we always making deals. You know there used to be a program on the TV. Let's make a deal, and we're always trying to make a deal with us and God. We're trying to make deals with Him. Hey, the deal's already made. <laughs> there ain't no deal. Christ was the deal. He shed His blood for our sins. Past, present, and future. But we still had to confess them. And what causes you, first of all, to confess? What that overpowering power that deals with you? Your conscience. Amen. That's the first thing God, he give everybody a conscience. I, I remember when I was on the police department in Cape, and uh, Morley Swingle, he was a highway patrolman, and he was the only person in southeast Missouri at that time that knew how to do a polygraph uh, examination. He was a certified polygraph expert. So they had a murder in Charleston, and they brought this guy up to the uh, Cape PD. I, I was in there the day he, they brought him in there. <laughs> and they, he was the man that had did the crime. So uh, they was trying to get him to confess to it. So uh, they was going to run the, poly uh, Morley was going to run the uh, polygraph, which he did. And a couple of hours later, he come. I would happen to be in the station again, and I asked uh, Morley. I said, "Well, how did the test go?" He said, "Tom," and he was getting close to retirement at that time, but he'd been in law enforcement a long time. He'd been giving polygraphs to a lot of people. He said he was the only person that he'd ever talked to that he, he believed he didn't, he didn't even have a conscience. He couldn't feel guilty about nothing because he didn't have a conscience. That's how far he was removed from God. He said, I couldn't find any proof that he had a conscience. You can, that only works if somebody's got a conscience. Then it operates on their nervous system. It makes them nervous. It makes them sweat. It makes, you know, you know how it is when you stumble and fall, and it's your fault. You know how it happens. You get so beat down, you, be, uh, you, you, you feel like a, an old dog, you know, that's 
ain't no good. And the devil's telling you all the time, you ain't no good. You're not even a Christian. You wouldn't have done that. Has he ever told you that? Well, that's the same guy that bothers me, see. He tells me the same thing. Amen. All right. Number six. Linda, you've got this in. What is the difference between access to God and feeling oneself to be close to him? Is what? I told y'all on the front end, you can't go with those page numbers because our page numbers is not the same as they are here. You have to read the whole thing <laughs> like I did two or three times. All right, let's see. Okay. All right. What is the difference between access to God and feeling and feeling oneself to be close to him. Well, that's an easy one, really. Uh, let me see. If... Number one. Number one. How does a believer walk? By faith. By faith. He puts no confidence in the flesh. In other words, and in your flesh, you've got feelings. I got my feelings hurt. You know, we all been there. For feelings come and feelings go. And feelings are deceitful. My warrant is the word of God. Not else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned for one of for want of one sweet token, I know one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. I will trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. The words of men shall pass away. God's word abides forever. Let me tell you, put no confidence in your feelings. That's not a reliable source amen as with many other stages of our Christian experience this manner of access to God has two phases an initial that's when you first come to Christ to get forgiveness of your sins that's your first initial access to him and a progressive one. Huh? Question number six. Well, I'm not down to number seven yet. Oh, well, that's... I see what you're saying. Okay, I didn't know I wrote it twice. Okay, but that's, that remains true even to number six. Because we're, we're dealing here between the difference between access to God and feelings one to be close to him. You see? So basically, what are the two phases of access to God in a Christian experience? So question number seven answers question number six. Uh I put down here for question number seven, the uncertain grounds of feeling. Feelings are uncertain. Put no confidence in your feeling. What does God's word say? That's what we put confidence in. We walk by faith, not by feelings. B, the approach is based on the fact of the unchanging blood of the Lamb of God. You know what? I was just praying this morning here over at the church. And I was thanking God because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what? We pray to the same God that Abraham prayed to. 
We pray to the same God that was with Daniel in the lion's den. We, we, we pray to the same God that delivered Israel out of the land of bondage. He has not changed. He is a present help in a time of trouble. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he says. That has not changed. It's still applicable for today. And we must always remember that. God never changes. We change. We're the, we always change. God never does. That's what he told Israel over there in Malachi. He, told, he said that he was the God of Jacob, you sons of men. <laughs> oh, boy. I tell you what, I don't wish 81 on anybody. Let me see. Huh? That's it. Thanks, Ben. Amen. He said, because I don't change, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. If I change I, my mind, boy, you give me enough reasons to change it, but I don't change. Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, going back to number six, question number six. As with many other, here's what I wrote, as with many other stages of our Christian experience, this matter of access to God has two phases, an initial and a progressive one. The former is presented to us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. And the latter is Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 22. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's the first step, the first step the first uh, phase. Now the second phase is the progressive one. And that's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus. Well, where did you get this boldness? Ephesians chapter 2, 13 explains it. And then I'll go on and read verse uh, 22. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. To begin with, I was made nigh by the blood and to continue in that new relationship, I come through the blood every time. It is not that I was saved on one basis and that I now maintain my fellowship on another. The blood hasn't changed. We still put our trust in the blood. Amen. All right. Well, question number seven. What are the two phases of access to God in a Christian experience, Richard? Well, I'll take that. I am <laughs> just checking you out. <laughs> You're right. That's what I've been talking about. <laughs> God deals with our sins, sins by the blood. Yeah. Now, he deals with that sin nature by the cross. We haven't covered that yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Number eight, question number eight. 
we're, we're back to being again, right? How does the blood work against Satan? Anybody else got anything different? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. See? How does the blood work against Satan? He does so by putting God on the side of man against him I got that but I was giving you some scripture here the redeeming work of Christ has restored man from his fallen nature to receive a new nature 2 Corinthians chapter 5 17 through 21 therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new you know what? We don't see enough newness. We still walking around here like an ordinary man. We don't see any new, I'm a new creature. We need to lay hold on that. The new man is Christ being in Christ. Spiritual. Everything about the new birth, it's all spiritual. There's nothing you can work out in the flesh. The Bible says that for in the flesh you cannot please God and you can never please God in the flesh. And that's hard. That's a hard thing to learn. I'm still, I'm still deal with it. But I praise God I'm getting more light on it all the time. Amen. The redeeming work of Christ has restored man from his fallen nature to receive a new nature. And you know what that new nature is? Can somebody give me a scripture that tells it? How about Galatians chapter 2 verse 20? Paul, he describes, he, you know, the name of this book is The Normal Christian Life. And a good definition of a Christian life, Paul furnishes to us in Galatians chapter 2, 20. This is the foundation of our walk. And he says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm in the flesh, but I'm not living in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That's the normal Christian life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Anybody got any comments to make? You know, this is the this is the thing about this Christian life that makes it that makes it so uh, almost unattainable. It is unattainable because the scripture says it's a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God. That's why we struggle and struggle to try to attain it by something that we've done, going to do, or whatever. Something in the flesh that we can be satisfied that we're pleasing God. Let me tell you, you'll never please God in the flesh. The scripture says you can't. For in the flesh you cannot please God. 
You're not subject to the law of God. Your flesh is not subject to the law of God. And it goes on to say, neither indeed can it be. That's in Romans chapter 8. Neither indeed can it be. There's no way that you can please God in the flesh. You know why? Everything, everything that the flesh touches, mind, soul, body, everything that flesh, it's contaminated. Our only victory is found in Christ. It's in him we live and move and have our being. For when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. It's all predicated on Christ. And we must get that revelation. I can't please God in my flesh. I can't even please Bessie. How, how in the world can I please God? Who is holy. I can't even please another Creature like, like me, I can't please them. I can't even please myself. That shows the bankruptcy of the flesh. We need to get acquainted with that. And I feel like sometimes we, we try too hard. We're trying to attain something that is unattainable in the flesh. Colossians 1, 28. Okay. We'll read it here. Well, we'll start reading at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Y'all see that? That's a mystery, ain't it? I can't explain it. But that's a position that every believer is in. If any man be in Christ. Okay. The hope of the glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which he worketh in me mightily. It's all Christ, brother and sister. It's all predicated on him and what he's done and what he is doing. In myself, I can do nothing. Anybody else got a comment? Okay, uh, who's got uh, question number nine? Is that Erica? Okay, what is the reason for our ready acceptance of Satan's accusation? Because Satan says we are, we, well, we believe it. Because <laughs> we're not expecting anything good to come out of it. So when he accuses you, what do we do? When Satan says, uh-huh, you hypocrite. What do we do? That's right. We agree with him. He knows me. <laughs> okay, Erica, go ahead, hon. That's a couldn't ask for a better answer than that. We put our confidence in the blood. Thus, accusations become one of the greatest and most effective of Satan's weapons. 
He points to our sins and seeks to charge us with them before God. And if we accept his accusations, we go down immediately. Now the reason why we are so red, we so readily accept his accusation is that we are still hoping to have some righteousness of our own. The ground of our expectation is wrong. Satan has succeeded in making us look in the wrong direction. How many remembers that quote that I put on last week's lesson by A.W. Pink? He said the biggest mistake that most of God's people make is a look inward trying to find what is only found in Christ. I've told this before, I don't look inward, you'll always be condemned. All, that, all that's going to show you is the weakness of the flesh. You look inward and you'll see what a, a scoundrel you are. And so therefore we agree with Satan. We know what we are. In my flesh, I cannot please God. How many times do we have to hear that before we start believing it? See, this is what's, this is what's hindered the church more than anything. You ain't got enough. The, the, the Satan's always, uh, then you got some church member that's always condemning you too. Your brother or sister in Christ, they can't find nothing good in you. Well, they're looking in the wrong direction. It shows what kind of a spirit they got. That's terrible. We're all the same boat made of the same way. You can have the boatload of the Holy Ghost. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost from top to bottom and still fail because the flesh, brother, is a wicked thing. There's no, <laughs> hey, there is no redemption for the flesh. God didn't come down to from heaven to make you a better person. Does everybody, everybody hear that? God didn't come down, die on the cross to make you a better person. He come to make a new creature out of you, a new creation. He, this whole one's already done. It's done. Boy, I tell you what, I think, uh, I think Watchman Nee was right on target. I think that's the truth. That's why I say give this to your friends. Let them hear the good truth. Amen. But if we have learned to put no confidence in the flesh, we shall not wonder if we sin, for the very nature of the flesh is to sin. That's his nature. I, I took that from I took that from Watchman Nee. Philippians chapter three and three I took out of the Bible. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. How many is there ever you've been boy, I tell you what. I've had a pretty good day today. I didn't lust after no other woman. I didn't do this and I didn't do that. Well, that's you're putting confidence in the flesh. Y'all see what I'm saying? And he says, we are the circumcision which worship God. That's Philippians 3 and 3. Hey, that's in your Bible. And we worship God in the spirit, not in the flesh, but in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's pretty good, ain't it? Amen. All right, Debbie, number 10, question number 10. 
suggest ways by which God can show us more of his son in order to solve our problems. You put what? That's a, that's, a, that's a good thing because Hosea said in chapter 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Isaiah 5 verse 13 says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitudes dried up with thirst. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for of hearing the word of the Lord. I believe that's the day we're living in. All they want to teach is some foolishness. They're not interested in the word. In Psalms 119, verse 11, David said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So the ways by which God can show us more of his son, it says, suggest ways that God, which God can show us more of his son. What? Ask the pastor. <laughs> that's, that's the wrong direction. <laughs> Would you read it, hon? Amen. But I say... Have they not heard? Verse, Verily their sound went up into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. That's Romans 10 and what? 17. So there in faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's pretty plain. Anybody got a comment to make? Amen. Well, that does it on our questions. I thought that was pretty good. I thought everybody had a good, good answer. Uh, does anybody have a, a comment to make? Anything to say?